You don't mind if I take this off, do you? Um, well, first of all, what a, what a privilege to be here. Um, I'm nervous. I never get nervous. Um, I bring you greetings from the big Washington. <laughs> America's largest theme park. <laughs> or as uh, we like to call it, Hollywood on the Potomac. My friend James Carville, the Ragin' Cajun from, uh, from Louisiana, likes to say, Howard, politics is show business for ugly people. <laughs> so I'm glad to get out of that city of ugly people to be here in Little Washington, uh, a place I've known all my life and a place that I treasure as do you. Uh, the first thing I want to say, of course, is this. Witchy quacks. <laughs> How did I do? Uh, when I first heard this phrase, I was confused. <laughs> what did that mean? Witchy quacks, a sect of satanic physicians. Think about it. A flock of demonic ducks. Uh, so I asked uh, last night the, your president, THS, what does it mean? And she said, Howard, it means keep it short. Correct. So here goes, President Herring Smith, distinguished trustees, fellow honorees, and by the way, can I just say the honorees, are, their records are remarkable and I'm so honored to be among them. The esteemed faculty, uh, beloved parents, and of course the already hammered members of the W&J class of 2015. <laughs> It's an honor to be here. Congratulations to the graduates and their families. You should be proud of what you've achieved. You have gotten an amazing education at this wonderful liberal arts college, one of the oldest and most distinguished in America. You've worked hard, you're well prepared for a future in which things are going to change and then change and then change and then change again. The only constant in life is change and you are prepared for that in every possible way. And parents, your love, devotion, and support have made all that possible. And faculty, your wisdom uh, has helped make it happen. So students, I'd like you to, to give a round of applause to your parents and to the faculty, those old people who made it all happen. Really. Now, you, you graduates probably think that I'm going to tell you all to put down and turn off your mobile phones. That, in fact, is uh, essential for living lives sanely and well. But for now, please Snapchat, Vine, Tweet, Instagram, Facebook, Meerkat, Periscope, Skype, WeChat, Gchat, text, email, anything you want while I take a panoramic picture of this scene. So go ahead. There you go. That's going up on my Twitter feed momentarily. Anybody who wants to periscope this live, please feel free. Uh, there are two objectives here. Number one, we want to go viral here in Washington County, Pennsylvania. And the other is it's for the benefit of the students because it's the only way you're going to remember anything that happened at this event. Uh, I come from the land of presidents. 
So it's appropriate that I'm here. Uh, the, until today, the greatest number of presidents that I ever saw at one time was in the White House in the East Room in 1991. I just started covering the White House for Newsweek. President George H.W. Bush invited all the living presidents to the White House for a reunion. It had never happened. So there up on the dais in the, uh, in, in the East Room beneath those beautiful chandeliers were Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford, Ronald Reagan, and Richard Nixon. And America's leading political humorist at the time, some of the older folks will remember Senator Bob Dole. Uh, some students actually laughed about that. Anyway, Bob Dole, who was a marv had a marvelous wit, came back to the back where we reporters were standing behind a velvet rope and said, gentlemen, pointing at the presidents on the dais, there they are. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, and evil. <laughs> so now here I am, there are hundreds of presidents around. These are all presidents I'm seeing. Uh, and by the way, uh, hat tip to the, uh, to the class of 65, you guys look great. Uh, really. So, you know, I met all these presidents. There's only one other president I need to meet, one other W&J president, and of course, he is the most powerful person on the planet. I speak, of course, of Commissioner Roger Goodell, <laughs> W&J class of 81. Barack Obama can blow up the world. Roger Goodell can blow up the New England Patriots. <laughs> That is the power of a W&J education. <laughs> so, uh, why am I here? Well, I'm from Pittsburgh, that's number one, and very proud of it, as was said. Uh, that was no achievement on my part, it just happened. Uh, kids from my high school, Taylor Alderdice in Pittsburgh, attend W&J. We know about it, we've known about it since I was a kid. Uh, I believe in travel, uh, and in the world of travel, digging as deep as you can. I had a fellowship, as did THS, um, that is the model for the Magellan Fellowships here. And um, there's nothing better than uh, actually putting down your phone and going. And just as she does, I believe with all my heart in the kind of education that you've got here. And I want to speak not only to you, but to the faculty. Uh, yeah, there's online education. You know, you can take a MOOC with somebody from Stanford or Harvard. That's great. But I believe that real education still involves face-to-face, person-to-person, heart-to-heart. And you have the privilege, students, of having uh, obtained the fire, if you will, from the wisdom of the people here. That, to me, in a small community, uh, with a real thriving sense of community, which this place obviously has, you can just feel it, it's palpable, uh, is to me what makes undergraduate education. Um, in my, my world, actually, I think undergraduate education is kind of redundant or superfluous or something. It's education, and that's who you are, and that's what Washington and, uh, and Jefferson College does. Uh, so, in my view, that makes you absolutely indispensable to the new media age we live in and that I work in and I'm doing my best to advance. The education you got here is the best possible preparation for becoming what you must become in the age of social media, digitally distributed news, instant access to big data. Uh, you've got to sort it out, and you have the education to do it. Today, information is not only cheap, uh, it's overwhelming, I would say suffocatingly available, which makes wisdom, discerning wisdom, that much more rare and that much more needed. Every one of you has the tools to be his or her own reporter, 
videographer, and news network, connected instantly and always to the rest of the planet. As you go forward in whatever career you choose, whatever your calling is, whatever life you lead, I hope you will also take time to be citizen editors, to find meaning and moral lessons in the noise and find ways to contribute to the ongoing conversation that is our country. And by the way, THS told me about the dorm where people of opposite views live together. What a great idea. Nobody must get much sleep there. Um, I would also say that you here at W&J have a special inspiration for this role, obviously, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Now, if they were around today, they would be tweeting, Skyping, periscoping, meerkat, they'd be doing the whole nine yards. They were the social media innovators of their day. Prolific letter writers. I mean prolific. Uh, pamphleteers, uh, authors of newspaper articles, contenders in the public square, speech makers, and champions of the internet of their day, which was a fast and reliable post office. Uh, and by the way, the, the 50 bucks that you got from Benjamin Franklin to start the library is something that is an extra symbol of what I'm talking about. Um, all of these people knew and said that education was the key to citizenship and therefore the fate of this country. Uh, I see America, the best of America here today, out there in the audience on the stage. And it takes that kind of engagement to preserve it. Every generation has a battle to preserve what we originally won and you have that battle to take up in the education to do it. Thomas Jefferson said, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. And he almost also famously said, if I had to choose between a government with no newspapers or newspapers with no government, I would not hesitate to choose the latter. Uh, that's a favorite quote of everybody in journalism. <laughs> even if it isn't necessarily true. Uh, okay, now the first thing you gotta do is figure out the 2016 election. Now I'm speaking to the, especially to the graduates. And that's because you're ground zero of the 2016 campaign. Uh, just the other day I was talking to the leader of the Clinton effort. And I've talked to a lot of Republican campaign managers as well. Everything else is pretty much sorted out you are, you millennials, and you're the sort of the last of the millennials, are the undecided of the undecided. In 2008 and 2012, you were crucial in deciding those elections. Uh, the Republicans want back into the conversation. Uh, there's going to be a ton of money spent and a lot of effort given over to winning your vote. The campaigns and the billionaires who fund them will want to convince you, to woo you, to inspire you but maybe also to confuse or depress you. They will want to tell you some truths, but they'll also want to tell you something lesser than that. They will show you video with context and without. And I will go on to say that I think that this next presidential election will be the nastiest and most brutal of modern times. Uh, that's an easy prediction to make, because they all are. Uh, <laughs> But this one, I think, especially so. There will be too much money chasing too few votes. Hope may matter less than fear, I fear. Uh, independent PACs, you know, those big billionaire dark money PACs, they'll be free to go negative without shame or restraint. So you're going to have to sort it out. How are you going to do that? Well, based on all of my many, many years in all aspects of the business, I've worked at a wire service, I worked at a newspaper, I worked at broadcast television, network television, daily newspaper, news magazine, uh, now online, you know, periscoping myself. Uh, I've done everything but skywriting. I, I might try that, but... Uh, I've come up with seven quick rules, and I'm, I'm sorry to give you this little mnemonic device, it's kind of like... Sesame Street for grown-ups, and you're not going to remember it anyway, but 
if you're curious after the fact, email me and I'll send them to you. I call them the seven C's, and not as in oceans, but as in the letter C. Uh, and here they are. Number one, curiosity. You learn how to do this. Always ask why. Always seek more knowledge. Educate yourself. And I would say here, yes, put down the phone. Go there. I had a journalism professor whose simple uh, epigrammatic advice was go there. Meaning, if, be curious and go there. That's what the Magellan program does. It's symbolic of this college now. Do it on your own. Those are words to live by. Two, critical thinking. Never assume anything. Do not assume. Be skeptical, but don't be cynical. Because cynicism is, is lazy, intellectually lazy. It's a form of shutting yourself off. It's a form of closed-mindedness. Context is number three. Try to put everything you consume in the media into a larger context. Uh, that means talking to people face to face. And it means deep diving using big data. Uh, learn about it. Figure out how to use it, which I'm sure has been a part of your education here. Number four is be calm. Calm. And what I mean by that is that the world of media around you, and indeed the society around you, is operating at an ever faster and faster pace. Uh, to the point of making everybody crazy. Everybody, there's so many people leaping to conclusions that they're leaping off the nearest cliff. Stand back, be calm, calm down, be considerate. And by considerate, I mean take consideration of things. Number five, compassion. Nothing is worth communicating or knowing that doesn't relate somehow to the idea of love and justice in the world. You don't know things just for the sake of knowing them. You know them to make things better for your family, for yourself, to realize your potential for the country, for the world. If you can't empathize with your fellow man, you can't understand and act upon the information you are taking in. Number six, connect. That is, once you've figured something out to your satisfaction, say it out loud. Get in the conversation. That's what I wrote my book about. That's what I think American democracy is about. You've probably heard the famous injunction of the writer E.M. Forster, who, who summarized the work of life in two words. He said, only connect. And last but not least, the seventh C is conscience. You need an internal moral compass to discern what's important. Some call it a soul. Some refer to a sacred text. Someone else we revere here at w and had this advice. Labor to keep alive in your breast that little spark of celestial fire called conscience. It's a beautiful statement, and you know who said it. George Washington. When he did so, he was a young man about your age. He was a student heading out into life. w and has lit that celestial fire within you. Now go and light the way for us all. Thank you very much.